In the grand tapestry of history, few figures loom as large as Napoleon Bonaparte. A military genius, a visionary leader, and the architect of an empire that stretched across continents. But with great historical figures often come great myths and misconceptions. Today, we embark on a journey to unravel the mysteries surrounding one of history's most iconic figures, Napoleon Bonaparte. Bonjour, mes amis. Welcome to Past Portraits, where we delve into the fascinating world of history. I'm Mr. Hastings, and in today's video, we'll be debunking 10 myths about Napoleon that have endured through the sands of time. From his supposed short stature to tales of a mysterious complex, we'll separate fact from fiction, exploring the man behind the legend. So grab your bicorn hat and join us on this captivating journey as we uncover the truth about Napoleon Bonaparte. In the annals of history, there persists a charming myth that cloaks Napoleon Bonaparte in the gentle melody of a distinctive French accent. The image of the Corsican-born military genius, draped in his iconic bicorn hat, is often accompanied by the imagined cadence of a uniquely French intonation. However, the reality is a subtle departure from this fanciful portrayal. Napoleon, despite his Corsican roots, did not possess a particularly strong French accent. Raised in Corsica and educated in mainland France, he spoke French with a Corsican-Italian accent, a nuance that seasoned his speech with a blend of linguistic flavors. His early years at the military academy in Brienne and later at the École Militaire in Paris refined his language skills, instilling in him a proficiency in French that transcended regional accents. Napoleon was known for his eloquence and clarity of expression, traits that set him apart as a charismatic orator and a shrewd communicator. In the Grand Salons of Paris and on the fields of battle, Napoleon's words resounded with authority, devoid of the stereotypical accent that folklore often attributes to French speakers. His speeches, letters, and commands were delivered with a precision and clarity that befitted a military strategist and statesman of his caliber. While the allure of a French-accented Napoleon may add a touch of romanticism to the narrative, the historical truth unveils a leader whose linguistic prowess transcended the confines of regional inflections. The echoes of his words, unburdened by a caricatured accent, continue to reverberate through the corridors of time, a testament to the enduring legacy of a man who spoke the language of power and diplomacy with unmatched eloquence. In the annals of historical misperceptions, the myth of Napoleon Bonaparte's short stature stands as a testament to the enduring power of misconstrued narratives. The widely held belief that the French emperor was unusually diminutive has perpetuated through time, etching an inaccurate portrait in the public imagination. Contrary to the popular notion of Napoleon as vertically challenged, his stature was, in fact, unremarkable for his era, measuring around five feet six inches. The misperception likely arose from the conversion of French measurements to the British imperial system, creating an illusion of lesser height. Yet, as the pages of history unfold, the truth reveals itself, liberating Napoleon from the confines of a myth that erroneously diminished his physical stature. In reality, the man who reshaped the course of nations stood not as a diminutive figure, but as a towering force in the annals of human history. In the intricate tapestry of historical narratives, the characterization of Napoleon Bonaparte as a Democrat remains a subject of nuanced interpretation. While some argue that Napoleon implemented certain democratic principles, others contend that his rule was fundamentally authoritarian, marked by centralized power and control. 
It is true that Napoleon's ascent to power was facilitated by the ideals of the French Revolution, with its emphasis on liberty, equality, and fraternity. His administration did introduce legal and administrative reforms that aimed to streamline governance, create equality before the law, and dismantle feudal privileges. The Napoleonic Code, a comprehensive legal system, is often cited as a cornerstone of these efforts. However, the democratic veneer of these reforms is tempered by the fact that Napoleon centralized power in his own hands, ultimately establishing himself as Emperor of the French. The democratic aspirations of the revolution were subordinated to his ambition for a stable and authoritative government. Moreover, Napoleon's method of governance involved plebiscites or direct votes by the people to legitimize his rule. While these plebiscites provided an illusion of democratic participation, critics argue that they were carefully orchestrated to secure the desired outcome rather than genuinely reflecting the will of the people. In the end, the debate over Napoleon as a democrat is complex and multifaceted. While he implemented some democratic principles, his overarching political structure and personal ambitions were more aligned with autocracy. The dichotomy of his rule, straddling between revolutionary ideals and authoritarian consolidation, leaves historians grappling with the nuanced legacy of Napoleon Bonaparte in the context of democratic governance. In the pages of history, the idea that Napoleon Bonaparte declared war on the British solely for personal reasons casts a shadow over the intricate geopolitical dance of the Napoleonic era. To reduce the conflict to a mere vendetta neglects the intricate tapestry of factors that fueled the flames of the Anglo-French rivalry. As Napoleon ascended to power in post-revolutionary France, the winds of change swept across Europe, carrying with them a fervor for territorial expansion and dominance. Amidst the tumultuous landscape, Britain emerged as a formidable adversary to Napoleon's grand ambitions. Trade and economic rivalries painted the backdrop of the conflict. The British and the French, economic powerhouses of their time, clashed over control of global trade routes and colonial territories. Napoleon's continental system, an economic embargo against British goods, was a calculated response to the economic stranglehold Britain sought to impose. The vast expanse of the seas became a battleground for supremacy. Britain's naval dominance, a formidable force that stood in defiance of Napoleon's imperial aspirations, led to blockades and conflicts that echoed the struggle for control over the high seas. Yet beneath the surface, the conflict was not merely a clash of economies and naval powers. It was a clash of political ideologies. The constitutional monarchy and parliamentary system of Britain stood in stark opposition to Napoleon's autocratic rule. The ideological undercurrents ran deep, contributing to the enduring hostilities. Territorial ambitions, driven by Napoleon's vision of a dominant European empire, further fueled the flames of war. Britain, cognizant of the potential implications of a powerful French juggernaut, actively resisted the expansionist aspirations. While personal motivations inevitably influenced political decisions, framing the conflict as a personal vendetta belies the intricate interplay of geopolitical forces. The Napoleonic Wars were a manifestation of a Europe grappling with revolutionary echoes, economic rivalries, and a struggle for dominance that transcended the personal desires of a single leader. In the end, the conflict unfolded not merely as a pursuit of personal glory, but as a symphony of historical forces shaping the destiny of nations. The narrative that Napoleon Bonaparte was solely responsible for the creation and implementation of the metric system is a historical oversimplification. 
while Napoleon did play a significant role in the standardization of weights and measures in France, the roots of the metric system can be traced back to the Enlightenment era and the French Revolution. The push for a standardized system of measurements gained momentum in the late 18th century as part of broader efforts to rationalize and modernize society. During the French Revolution, the French Academy of Sciences, influenced by Enlightenment ideals, proposed the development of a decimal-based system of measurement. This proposal aimed to replace the traditional and often confusing array of regional and guild-specific units. The metric system, based on powers of 10, was officially introduced in France in 1795. It included units such as the meter for length and the gram for mass. The initial adoption, known as the Messieurs Usuel, coexisted with traditional units for some time. Napoleon Bonaparte, recognizing the advantages of a standardized system for governance and commerce, further promoted the metric system. In 1799, he appointed a commission to refine and expand its use. The metric system became compulsory in France in 1840, years after Napoleon's reign. While Napoleon contributed to the promotion and enforcement of the metric system, it would be inaccurate to credit him as its sole architect. The metric system was a collaborative effort shaped by Enlightenment thinkers, scientists, and the societal transformations of the French Revolution, with Napoleon contributing to its institutionalization during his rule. In the labyrinth of history, the year 1812 stands as a testament to Napoleon Bonaparte's audacious venture into the heart of Russia, an undertaking that transcended personal glory and plunged Europe into the depths of conflict. The narrative of Napoleon's invasion, often reduced to a pursuit of individual acclaim, unravels into a complex tapestry woven with geopolitical intricacies and strategic ambitions. As the Grand Army crossed the Niemen River into Russian territory, the motivations behind Napoleon's decision to declare war on Russia echoed across the vast expanse of the continent. It was a confluence of factors, a delicate dance between political calculus and imperial ambitions. Napoleon's vision of a continental empire, a Europe molded under the weight of French dominance, propelled him to view Russia not merely as a nation, but as a strategic piece on the chessboard of his grand design. Control over Russia meant control over a vast reservoir of resources and an extension of his geopolitical influence. The economic chess game played a pivotal role. The Russian refusal to bow to the economic pressures of Napoleon's continental system, a blockade against British trade, added fuel to the flames. The invasion became a coercive measure, an attempt to bend Russia to the economic strategy forged in the corridors of power. Alliances, shifting and strained, painted the backdrop. Napoleon's pursuit of personal glory intertwined with the need to maintain dominance over his allies, to reinforce the perception of invincibility that had become synonymous with his name. Yet, as the Russian campaign unfolded, the intricate threads of strategy began to unravel. The misjudgment of Russian resilience, the brutal embrace of scorched-earth tactics, and the harsh winter took their toll on the Grand Army. The narrative that had begun with visions of glory ended in the icy wastelands of a Russian winter, a testament to the unpredictability of warfare and the pitfalls of overreaching ambition. While personal legacy and glory certainly played a part in Napoleon's decisions, the invasion of Russia was a symphony of strategic miscalculations, geopolitical chess moves, and the unpredictable nature of warfare. It unfolded not merely as a quest for personal renown, but as a chapter in the tumultuous saga of European history, leaving an indelible mark on the contours of nations and the fate of empires. The grandiose title of Emperor of Europe, attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte, is a historical misnomer that encapsulates the complexity and ambition of his imperial aspirations. 
While Napoleon did seek to establish a hegemony over the European continent, the title itself was never officially held or recognized. Napoleon's meteoric rise to power saw him crowned as Emperor of the French in 1804, a title that reflected his dominance over the newly established French Empire. His strategic and military successes had already solidified France as a major power in Europe. The Napoleonic Code, administrative reforms, and a centralized authority reshaped the political landscape within the French borders. The concept of Emperor of Europe emerged as a consequence of Napoleon's desire to extend his influence beyond the borders of France. His vision was to create a system of client states and satellite kingdoms, often led by his family members or loyal allies, effectively forming a network of territories under French influence. While Napoleon successfully expanded his dominance across much of Europe during the Napoleonic Wars, the notion of a single unified empire of Europe under his direct rule was never fully realized. The diverse array of territories, cultures, and political systems presented formidable challenges to the establishment of such a unified empire. The title, Emperor of Europe, is more aptly described as a symbolic representation of Napoleon's ambition rather than an official designation. It reflects his aspiration to leave an indelible mark on the geopolitical landscape of the continent, even though the intricacies of power dynamics and the resilience of other European nations ultimately prevented the realization of a singular Napoleonic-dominated European empire. There is no historical evidence to support the claim that Napoleon Bonaparte converted to Islam. Napoleon was born into a Catholic family, and throughout his life he identified as a Catholic. His religious affiliation played a role in both his personal life and his political decisions. Napoleon was baptized as a Catholic in infancy, and he received education influenced by Catholic teachings. As he rose to power in France, he established himself as a political leader with a keen interest in maintaining stability and control. While he signed agreements with Muslim leaders during his military campaigns in Egypt and the Middle East, these were largely strategic moves rather than indicative of a personal religious conversion. Napoleon's approach to religion was pragmatic, and he sought to balance the interests of the state with those of the church. In 1801, he signed the Concordat with the Pope, re-establishing relations between the Catholic Church and the French government. This agreement aimed to reconcile the Church with the French Revolution's secular principles while securing its support for the political regime. In summary, there is no credible historical evidence to support the claim that Napoleon Bonaparte converted to Islam. Throughout his life, he maintained his Catholic identity and his interactions with Islam were primarily influenced by political and strategic considerations rather than personal religious beliefs. The theory that Napoleon Bonaparte was poisoned during his exile on the island of St. Helena remains a subject of historical speculation and debate. While there have been conspiracy theories suggesting foul play, the mainstream consensus among historians and medical experts is that Napoleon died of stomach cancer. Napoleon's health had been deteriorating for some time before his death in 1821. He experienced various health issues, including abdominal pain, nausea, and weight loss. His symptoms are consistent with those of gastric cancer. The diagnosis of stomach cancer was made by the attending physicians, including Dr. Francesco Antomarchi, who conducted the post-mortem examination. The official autopsy report confirmed the presence of stomach cancer, and this has been widely accepted as the cause of Napoleon's death. However, conspiracy theories suggesting poisoning, possibly by arsenic, have persisted over the years. Proponents of the poisoning theory point to the high levels of arsenic found in samples of Napoleon's hair, which were analyzed many years after his death. However, 
Scientific opinions on the significance of these findings vary, with some experts arguing that the elevated arsenic levels could be attributed to various factors, including the embalming process, contamination over time, or even naturally occurring arsenic in the environment. Despite the persistent theories, the prevailing view among historians and medical experts is that Napoleon Bonaparte died of stomach cancer while in exile on St. Helena. The poisoning hypothesis lacks conclusive evidence and is generally regarded as unsubstantiated. The tale of Napoleon Bonaparte being banished to a tiny island is a historical truth, but the depiction of the island as tiny might be a simplification. After his defeat at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, Napoleon was indeed exiled. But instead of a diminutive isle, he was sent to the relatively remote and isolated island of St. Helena. St. Helena is situated in the South Atlantic Ocean, approximately 1,200 miles off the west coast of Africa. While it is not large compared to continental land masses, it is larger than the term tiny might suggest. The island's rugged terrain and geographic isolation made it an effective choice for Napoleon's exile, as it limited the possibility of escape. Napoleon spent the final years of his life on St. Helena, where he died in 1821. The island's isolation played a role in shaping the conditions of his captivity, and the legend of the great military leader confined to a distant and isolated island has endured in historical memory.